ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my pleasure once again to welcome you to the University of St. Thomas. Very happy to have you here. My name is Father Joseph Pilsner. I'm the chair of the theology department here at the University of St. Thomas. Very happy to welcome you to this, the fourth installment in our Lenten lecture series, and this is our 20th anniversary year. As those of you who have been here before know, our theme this year is the church and the media. Tonight we have a special honor, Dr. Robin Williamson, who is the chair of the communications department here at the University of St. Thomas, who knows about the media and indeed something about advertising. Our main topic tonight has agreed to be our uh, guest uh, introducer tonight. So um, would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Robin Williamson. The mass media create realities, and advertising is not only a source of many of those realities, but the means by which the mass media survive economically. Certainly a reason why advertising is ubiquitous. After all, where would the Houston Chronicle be without advertising? Probably by the way of the post. When we think of advertising, we also think of rhetoric, because advertising is applied rhetoric. There were three goals of rhetoric, according to Cicero, to teach, to delight, and to move to action. These are also the goals of modern ads. The best are most engaging and cause us to identify with the reality created in the world of that advertisement. Ads are paid communication by identified persons or organizations. They are informative, highly repetitive, simple, and above all, persuasive. Ads are arguments filled with motivational appeals which of course are based on our most basic drives, motives, emotions, and needs for rewards. For example, a common motivational appeal used in ads is affiliation. We rarely see an ad, or never see an ad, of people drinking alone on a park bench or in a back alley but they are in a happy, pleasant environment filled with smiling people, thus satisfying a need for belongingness. Others are important ones are fear, control, prominence, beauty, achievement, tradition, and the like. So there are many of these motivational appeals. The argument in the ad creates a need, which of course is satisfied by a product, a candidate, an organization, course of action, or service. Unfortunately, ads create many needs in the mediated world that are totally unnecessary. Ads are like those knick-knack shops where there isn't a single product there that we really need or want. Because the ad is a cleverly created persuasive message, the ad claims to satisfy all of our needs. Unfortunately, the ad has created some of those needs for us. And although there are watchdog organizations like the FCC, the FTC, and the Better Business Bureau that review and remove ads that are not truthful or are offensive, the most serious problem is never addressed. That is, ads create unrealistic expectations that probably cannot be realized. The more mediated we become as a society, the more severe the consequences. These issues and others will be explored by tonight's speaker, Dr. Randall Smith, UST Associate Professor of theology. Dr. Smith 
received his BA in chemistry at Cornell College, an MA in theology at the University of Dallas, and a PhD at the University of Notre Dame. An adult convert to Catholicism, Dr. Smith has had an extensive background in patristic and medieval theology, as well as ancient and medieval philosophy. Randy's topic tonight focuses on the unrealistic desires and needs fostered by the world of advertising. Let us warmly welcome Dr. Randall Smith. Thank you. How are we doing? Oh, that's good. Thank you, Cameron. Yeah, that works. That's like, woo. Okay. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank my uh, colleague, who may not be here, uh, Professor Ed Hauser. He read an earlier version of this paper and made some invaluable uh, comments and uh, additions. Also, I'd like to thank him for picking up my wife from the doctor <laughs> so that I could be here. Uh, I've been very happily married for just over a year. Before I got married, an evening was always free. There was nothing going on. Uh, but I was always late places. Now that I'm married, I always have these other strange obligations that I never used to have. But I'm still always late. <laughs> but not tonight. The Kemper, uh, my talk will be about, the Christi about Christian temperance and mimetic desire. One, the contemporary contradictions of temperance. Temperance would seem to rank high on the list of much-needed virtues in contemporary American society, from the greed of the Enron corporate directors to the lust of the pedophile Catholic priests, from the ubiquity of divorce among baby boomers to the sky-high rates of consumer debt. Many in America find themselves asking, why can't Americans control themselves anymore? And yet, by the same token, temperance remains oddly but undeniably compelling even in a culture that is often so unapologetically hedonistic. Take, for example, the following comments from the Boston Globe concerning the appointment of Sean O'Malley, a Franciscan friar, to be Archbishop of Boston in 2003. The Archbishop of Boston, quote, reeling and wounded after 18 months of nonstop crisis, now awaits the July 30th installation of an archbishop like none this city has ever seen, a bearded Franciscan friar who once took a vow of poverty who wants to be called by his first name, who eschews the trappings of princely power and whose career suggests he means it when he says his first priority is the poor. The early enthusiasm of the Boston Globe has waned, naturally, as over the years the Catholic Archbishop of Boston has increasingly shown himself to be, well, Catholic. <laughs> but what is odd is why the Globe should have lauded the election of a Capuchin friar in the first place especially for his dedication to, among other things, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Are we to believe that the editors of the Boston Globe wish to signal their public approval of the classic monastic virtues of the Catholic Church? That they were on the verge of exhorting their well-heeled readers to imitate St. Francis and, quote, sell all they have and go and follow Christ? Not likely. I mean, what would have happened to advertising revenues? Perhaps we should compare this generation to those scribes and Pharisees in the New Testament about whom Jesus remarked, they are like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another. We played the flute for you, but you did not dance. We sang a dirge, but you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating food nor drinking wine, and you said he is possessed by a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you said, look, he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. These are people, in other words, who can't seem to decide what they want. The editors of the Globe are enthralled, it seems, by the poverty, chastity, and the obedience of a simple Franciscan friar, and yet they continue to deploy the church that preaches the values of poverty, chastity, and obedience to a culture uncomfortable with that message. When it comes to temperance, we laud those who practice it, but castigate those who preach it. Thus, we also have in America the odd spectacle of high school and college-aged hedonists who, while resenting any suggestion from parents, teachers, or clergy that they should control their appetites, reserve some of their highest honors for the soldiers who have sacrificed all comfort and convenience to fight for justice half a world away. The temperance of the Gulf War soldiers who are willing to give up so many of the pleasures and comforts of American life, 
or the temperance of a Mother Teresa or a Gandhi are still popular among Americans, even American youth. But when was the last time a major newspaper, public high school administrator, or upper middle class parent publicly exhorted the youth of America to embrace the religious life or volunteer for military service? Doing without is not a popular option, except when other people are doing it. And yet, our problem is not simply that we in America are going soft, as some moral scolds have suggested. The fact is, American workers remain remarkably productive and hardworking, putting in, on average, 10 more weeks of work per year than their European counterparts. 10 more weeks per year. And when it comes to America's youth, many of the college students I teach are actually workaholics. What they seem to lack, however, is any clear sense of why they are working so hard. When I ask my students about their ultimate goals beyond job and career, things like, what do you want to do with your life? What kind of family do you want to have? What kind of legacy would you like to leave? What makes life and work meaningful? They often seem strangely confused by the questions, as though such things were totally beside the point. Rarely will they be able to identify an ultimate goal or purpose that would come close to justifying, even to themselves, the tremendous sacrifices they are making. Their problem, in other words, is not that they lack discipline per se. It's precisely that they lack temperance in its fullest sense. They lack a sense of balance grounded in a deep grasp of the ultimate meaning and purpose of life. They don't yet understand that temperance is precisely the virtue that can help them to achieve the balance they so desperately need and crave. Ambitious students from top colleges and universities will often announce as their motto, I've heard this many, many times from many different universities, we work hard and we party hard. <laughs> Sadly, neither seems to give them much satisfaction or happiness. In a remarkable, remarkable little article on temperance, British scholar Margaret Atkins has captured our predicament nicely. We appear, she says, to be simultaneously more earnest and more frivolous than ever before. Our working lives are driven by competitiveness, conformity, and obsessive search for quantifiable improvements. Our leisure is spent in an equally restless search for ephemeral stimulation. Correspondingly, our youngsters are both more anxious, more industrious, and more obedient in their work, and more passive, more materialistic, and more escapist at their play. The new Puritanism and the new Hedonism are two sides of a single coin, the idolatry of quantity, or the belief that more must be better. We used to resist, well, I'm sorry, we used to rest in order to be fresh for work, which included the most valuable work, that of caring for the home. This was because work was intrinsically purposeful now we work to maximize the income to pay for our potentially unlimited pleasures. If we are to resolve these contemporary contradictions concerning temperance, we will need to rehabilitate, and perhaps more importantly, re-envision the virtue of temperance for our own society and culture. Such a re-envisioning would, I believe, involve at least the following three elements. First, we will need to clarify the goal of temperance. We will need to give Americans a reason for being temperate that is not merely a function of some eventual economic outcome. It will not do, in other words, merely to use the language of delayed gratification. If you give up a short-term pleasure now, you will get much more pleasure in the long run. For reasons I will describe in a minute, this goal will serve neither the common good of society nor the ultimate fulfillment of its members. And it will still leave us subject to the subtle manipulations of the advertisers and marketers of American consumerism. Second, if we are to rehabilitate temperance, we must show that temperance is a positive virtue, one that helps us to preserve our freedom of thought and action, and not simply part of an elaborate plot to spoil everyone's fun. Margaret Atkins once again describes the problem nicely. Quote, English is not a good language, she suggests, for talking about virtue. A friend once put it succinctly. The Italian virtu means something that you do, the English virtue means something you don't do. <laughs> if you talk about virtue, it seems as if you are out to spoil someone's fun. Self-control and self-restraint imply a painful struggle to repress the real person and his or her wishes. What we must rediscover, then, are ways to describe the virtue of temperance in terms of human flourishing and human fulfillment, and not merely in terms of self-control, self-restraint, or repression. 
Thirdly, and this will be one of the major tasks for this evening, we will also need to pay special attention to the particular kind of desire that often drives us in contemporary American culture. The challenge to our becoming temperate is not merely that we are a society awash in wealth and material things, although we are. What is more puzzling is that very few of us think we are. As author Julia Chor points out in her best-selling book, The Overspent American, oddly, it doesn't seem as if we're spending wastefully or even lavishly. Rather, many of us feel we're just making it, barely able to stay even. But what's remarkable is that this feeling is not restricted to families of limited income. It's a generalized feeling, one that exists at all levels. 27% of all households making more than $100,000 a year say they cannot afford to buy everything they really need. <laughs> nearly 20% say they spend nearly all their income on the basic necessities of life. In the $50,000 to $100,000 range, 39% and one-third feel this way, respectively. Overall, half the population of the richest country in the world say they cannot afford everything they really need. And that's not just the poorer half. Let me suggest that we will never be able to restore the proper sense of balance and order in our society if we don't gain a better understanding of this paradox. Why so few of us consider ourselves rich in the richest country in the world. What we need to develop is a clearer sense of the way in which our passions and appetites are being unconsciously disordered and unbalanced by our current consumer culture. So, for example, few people seem aware that in the years after World War II, the concern among many retailers and economists was whether the economy could continue to expand. Once the economy had finally satisfied people's basic needs, it was thought, such as food, clothing, housing, shelter, and transportation, what more would people need to buy? Savvy marketers concluded that continued growth would depend upon what was called famously the organized creation of dissatisfaction. The result is that in many cases, products aren't developed in answer to the pre-existing needs of consumers. Rather, needs are manufactured in consumers in order to sell products. Thus, in order to restore a proper sense of balance, we will need to gain a clearer sense of how our passions and appetites are being systematically disordered and unbalanced by our current consumer culture. For if we do not get a clearer sense of the challenges we face, we will fail to understand why the traditional language of temperance is not serving us adequately. Urging teenagers, for example, to bear up, get tough, or learn to control themselves will largely do no good in our current cultural setting. The challenges we face are more complex than such comments would indicate, and we would do well to understand why. That language, dealing as it does with our most basic natural desires for food, drink, or the pleasures of touch will not be adequate, I fear, in a cultural setting where not merely our most simple and obvious desires are being inflamed, but where it is our imaginations that are being systematically manipulated. Two, Rene Girard and the challenges of mimetic desire. The specific challenge we face has been characterized well by philosopher and literary critic Rene Girard under the heading mimetic desire. According to Girard, in works of fiction, the characters often have desires which are fairly simple. There is, as he says, quote, only the subject and the object. The desire is always spontaneous. And, quote, it can always be portrayed by a simple straight line which joins subject and object. In such cases, it would seem, the traditional characterizations of the virtue of temperance would be sufficient. One's attentions are directed at a certain object or objects, the enjoyment of a certain sort of food or drink, or perhaps sex with a particular person. And what is needed to keep one's desires consonant with the order of reason and the divine law, as Thomas describes temperance, is the virtue of temperance. And that is the ability to control one's sense desires for these particular pleasures of touch. And yet, there is another more complex type of desire described nicely by Girard, one that involves three elements rather than merely two. Girard calls this sort of desire triangular desire or mimetic desire. In this kind of desire, the subject no longer chooses the objects of his own desire, but pursues objects which are determined by some model or mediator of desire. What the subject desires primarily is to be like another person, or perhaps even to be that person. And thus the object that the subject desires is what it is because he or she knows, imagines, imagines or suspects the mediator desires it. 
Don Quixote and Cervantes' novel is for Gerard, quote, a typical example of the victim of triangular desire. Unlike Sancho Panza, whose simpler desires are aroused by seeing a piece of cheese or a goatskin of wine, Quixote's desires are an imitation of the chivalric model set for him by the fictitious figure of Amadis of Gaul. Quixote tells Sancho, quote, I want you to know, Sancho, that the famous Amadis of Gaul was one of the most perfect knight errants. But what am I saying, one of the most perfect? I should say the only, the first, the unique, the master and lord of all those who existed in the world. I think that when a painter wants to become famous for his art, he tries to imitate the originals of the best masters he knows. The same rule applies to most important jobs or exercises which contribute to the embellishments of republics. Thus, the man who wishes to be known as careful and patient should and does imitate Ulysses, in whose person and works Homer paints for us a vivid portrait of carefulness and patience, just as Virgil shows us in the person of Aeneas, the valor of a pious son and the wisdom or of, of a valiant captain. And it is understood that, that, they, that they depict them not as they are, but as they should be, to provide an example of virtue for centuries to come. In the same way, says Quixote, Amadis was the post, the star, the sun for brave and amorous knights, and we others who fight under the banner of love and chivalry should imitate him. Thus, my friend Sancho, I reckon that whoever imitates him best will come closest to perfect chivalry. Quixote's chivalric passion, says Gerard, is a, quote, desire according to the other, as opposed to the desire according to oneself that most of us pride ourselves on enjoying. Thus, quote, Don Quixote and Sancho borrow their desires from the other in a movement which is so fundamental and primitive that they completely confuse it with the will to be oneself. Perhaps an even clearer example of the mischief that can be done by mimetic desire can be found in the figure of Flaubert's Emma Bovary, who claims Girard, quote, desires through the romantic hero heroines who fill her imagination. She wants desperately to be like them, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say she wants to be them, and more importantly, not herself. Literary scholar Jules de Gautier, for example, suggests that the goal of Flaubert's heroes is to, quote, see themselves as they are not. In order to accomplish this, they find a model for themselves and imitate from the person they have decided to be all that can be imitated, everything exterior, appearance, gesture, intonation, and dress. Adopting the person of the imagined other does not, however, bring poor Emma the dreamed of satisfaction for which she yearns. Quote, adultery, Emma was discovering, could be as banal as marriage. But what way out was there? She felt humiliated by the degradation of such pleasures but to no avail. She continued to cling to them out of habit or out of depravity, and every day she pursued them more desperately, destroying all possible happiness by her excessive demands. She blamed Léon, her adulterous partner, for her, dis her, her disappointed hopes, as though he had betrayed her. And she even longed for a catastrophe that would bring about their separation, since she hadn't the courage to bring it about herself. Still, she continued to write him loving letters faithful to the idea that a woman must always write to her lover. And although no, one would have hoped that Emma's dissatisfaction with her new life and lover might bring her to her senses, help bring her to realize that the path she had chosen could not really bring her the happiness she imagined it would, in fact, her dissatisfaction only lures her further and further into the illusions of her fervid imagination and greater enslavement to her mimetic desires. Quote, but as her pen flew over the paper, Emma was aware of the presence of another man, a phantom embodying her most ardent memories, the most beautiful thing she had read and her strongest desires. In the end, he became so real and accessible that she tingled with excitement, unable though she was to picture him clearly. So hidden was he, godlike, under his manifold attributes. He dwelt in that enchanted realm where silken ladders swing from balconies, moon bright and flower scented. She felt him near her. He was coming, coming to ravish her entirely in a kiss. And the next moment she would drop back to earth, shattered. For these rapturous love dreams drained her more than the greatest orgies. 
In the end, though, no matter how great her degradation, Emma could not escape her boredom. Worse yet, no matter how great Emma's degradation, she could not escape herself. Modern marketing and mimetic desire. Those who spend any time around teenagers know that Emma Bovary's fate is being repeated endlessly in middle schools, high schools, and colleges across the country. There are many young people in our society who, like Emma, seek to, quote, see themselves as they are not, who find a model for themselves, often a celebrity, sometimes merely a commercial persona, and imitate in that person, quote, once again, all that can be imitated, everything exterior, appearance, gesture, intonation, and dress. It is not so much the clothes, the sex, or the sports cars per se that capture our imaginations. It is the mimetic desire to become the elusive other. Someone, anyone, anyone but plain old boring me. These American youth carry with them the desire to imitate the lifestyles they see portrayed on movies, videos, and television shows. They are spread out across the country, spearheading a spending juggernaut that generates in excess of $150 billion per year in revenue for those who are ingenious enough to know how to exploit it. Advertising, of course, is nothing new, but its increasing degree of sophistication is, especially in its ability to exploit America's seemingly inexhaustible supply of mimetic desire. The way most contemporary advertising works, especially the advertising directed at the quote-unquote youth market, is by associating a product, whether it's a type of automobile, a brand of beer, or a particular style of blue jeans, with a certain persona, a created identity, that serves as the mimetic model for the shoppers. It's important that my type of automobile, brand of beer, or style of blue jeans is associated with the cool guy or girl, while the other guy's product is associated with a social loser, or worse yet, a parent. Thus, it is important that the model be the right kind of person. That is, the kind of person the prospective buyer wants to be. Allow me to illustrate briefly, if I may. Considering the following, consider the following advertisements, most of which were taken randomly from run of the real men's and women's magazines, such as can be found in any American supermarket, which, though for some of you, might mean you should cover your eyes during this part. Okay? I mean, there's no explicit pornography, but. I know, it's troubling. All right, these are two, uh, if I may, these are two advertisements I just found in you know, regular magazine. They're, they're very out of style now, but of course, if I cut them out six months ago, they'd be out of style now. Um, in any case, the point is, it's Pierre Cardin, which I don't actually know whether he's still in business anymore, but in any case, under that little caption, which you may not be able to read, up above where it says Pierre Cardin, is on both sides, actually, is when you find style, it becomes you, right? When you find style, it becomes you. Well, it seems to me that's exactly the opposite, right? Because the whole idea, is it not, is that when you find style, you become it, <laughs> right? You want to be these people, irrespective of the fact that standing this way would be almost impossible for anybody to do, <laughs> right? I, it looks better on her, I, you know, granted. Okay. Okay. Again, just, just a couple of others. I mean, these are, these are basically essentially random. Okay. This is a, uh, I take it, actually, I, I, I didn't really not, note down what they were selling, but I take it this is an uh, advertisement for a coat, right? And, you know, it's very important that you have a coat like this, you know, if you're landing planes on the Arctic, okay, <laughs> which would be also important in Houston, okay, and similarly. <laughs> Similarly, you know, here's another thing for a jacket, I think, the kind of jacket that would be very important to have if you were you know, chasing uh, piranha in the Amazon or something, right? Of course, this is, I guess, what explains people driving vehicles which are designed for uh, safaris on the Serengeti through the streets of Houston. You never know when you might see a gazelle jump out and you might have to off-road or something, right? Now, here's a series of advertisements, um, and it's for a thing which I, I don't really know. It's called the Mandarin Oriental Hotel Group, okay? And when I first saw this one, I thought, oh, maybe the hotel is kind of in the back there, okay? And so it's the Mandarin Oriental Hotel Group, and the, the thing says, if you can't see it, it says, they're fans, right? So we don't actually know anything about the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, 
right? Whether it's sort of the Asian equivalent of, you know, Hotel Six, but we know they're fans, okay? And then you go along, you say, she's a fan, all right? Now I'm starting to suspect this isn't anywhere near the Mandarin Orient of a hotel, right? But it's not, you know, unimportant that it's a wooden boat and she looks a little like, you know, Princess Grace or something, all right? Then I saw this and I said, she's a fan, and nobody really knows if this is actually, anybody know who this is? Yeah, Terry Hall, who used to be Mick Jagger's wife, okay? And so certain kinds of baby boomers might know that, right? And so it turns out she's a fan. But then I started to realize, I don't think this is the Mandarin Orient Hotel here, <laughs> right? I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking maybe not, right? And of course, so what that has to do with the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, I don't know. And then they're fans, right? Just to complete it, you want to make sure you cover all your bases. I suppose, and uh, maybe you know that's Dame Edna and then some other comic, maybe it's the same guy. Anyway, and again, I don't really think in the back that's the, that's the, uh, the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. So I don't actually know anything about the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. The beds are good, you know, they're cockroaches, anyway. but the point is, these people are all fans, okay? And then there's this, okay? This is an advertisement for Alitalia. And as I always have to admit to my students, and I'm very sorry about this, but I know nothing about Alitalia, right? I don't know whether their planes are any good. I don't know whether they crash every, you know, lots of planes. I don't know whether their maintenance is any good. I don't know whether their service is any good. But I want to go to Italy and fly Alitalia. <laughs> right? Now, the chances of my ending up in this fountain with this woman, right, are like basically nil, okay? But still, somehow, it's like, right, again, this has with airlines. They're in water. And if you're flying in an airline, <laughs> right? If you're in an airline and you're in water, you're in trouble, all right? OK, uh, this is, um, again, you know, I, this just seemed, you know, like, OK, this is an advertisement. I thought maybe I'll, I just ripped it out. And then going back through, I realized, oh, this is for, and I thought, what is this for? I realized, oh, it's, it's a new, it's Nautica, a new adventure in fragrance. Because, yeah, you'll want to wear perfume when you're out in the spray of the ocean. It's very important because, you know, you never know when somebody might come along. Okay? And, okay, here's another one. This is great because, you know, you can play with these images over time. This one is, you might think, oh, money, but you just have to see how this goes. Money. Okay? Look at those guys, particularly the guy in the middle. It's just not what it used to be. Right? Today, it says, the barriers to making it have fallen once and for all. If only that were true. A new generation of entrepreneurs have already made an indelible mark in American business. But where do they go from here? They give their money to us, obviously, right? <laughs> we're for you people, OK? And then, of course, it goes on. Money, all right? Look at that guy. He doesn't look so happy, OK? But money, right? It's just not what it used to be, right? Look at her looking at him. Okay, very different from the look she's sort of given anyway. Right. <laughs> Is it possible to be rich, it says, and not even know it? No. All right. <laughs> um, this is uh, something, actually I had a, a house made in at, at a certain point and got this, a man's manifesto. It was from the Bergdorf Goodman catalog. I, I don't really know anything about that, but anyway. This was in the Bergdorf Goodman catalog. It had women on one side, men on the other side, and this was the men's side, and it had a man's manifesto. And it says, I'm sorry if I could read this if you can't see it. Bergdorf Goodman is two very different stores, blah, blah, blah. OK. Um, that's why, beginning with this issue, we have two different covers. OK. Second paragraph. We hope that this magazine helps you understand the philosophy of our men's store. We believe that it's rather unique. In, ma in fact, it may seem like an unusual idea for a store to have a philosophy at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> but our school of thought is at the heart of what we do. Now, here's their philosophy. Other stores aim to dress a broad range of men. For some years, we entertained the possibility of this mission, too. That is a large store. We could serve all different kinds of men. You know, winners, losers, nerds, geeks, cool guys. Okay. But finally, we came to the realization that our store works best serving one sort of man very, very well. That sort of man, our customer has a rich and multifaceted life, and our merchandise selection is a reflection of that. We assume that our bespoke suit customer is the same man as our jeans customer. He is a gentleman of taste, refinement, and wit, a sort of post-millennial renaissance man, perhaps. 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He likes it's likely he wears a suit to work. He may wear a suit differently to go to dinner. On the weekend, he'll need suits for like you know every hour of the day. <laughs> On the weekend, he will wear clothing with a more relaxed attitude, but it will be no less carefully chosen, no less luxurious or well made than his business wardrobe. Now, let's be careful. Clothes, they say, don't make our man. No. In fact, he makes them come alive, reflecting his individuality. That's why, of course, as the catalog goes along, right, you can see characters in the catalog okay, that you're supposed to look like. Because once you put that on, it will reflect your individuality. Okay. By the way, this is, I love this. This is part of their you know, man's manifesto, every man for himself. Okay? Women and children last, I think it says underneath that. Okay? <laughs> You know, if these guys were on the, on the Titanic, it would have been a different story. Okay, so then you go through, right, and you know, then you see clothes that can reflect your individuality. Okay, and again, it's important that it's a wooden boat and it looks like, again, that you're in, what, Monaco or something like that, I guess. I've been in Monaco, so I don't know. Okay, here's an ad. I, that you can do this other thing, too, with students, for example. All right, this is a, sort of an interesting thing you can do. Um, you can go through Edie Hirsch's cultural literacy and you can take out randomly 50 titles. And then you can run them by students and see how many they know. Dubious, it depends, right? Then you can go through and take out you know, 25 or 30 ads from just random magazines. Cut off the name of the advertiser and then see whether students can tell you what it is, right? My students have absolutely, though this is a long, you know, ad from, I don't know, four or five years ago, my students have absolutely no trouble telling you what ad this is. Yeah, it's Tommy Hilfiger, okay? No problem, right? Absolutely no problem telling what this ad is just by the nature of the look of it. And you can go through a whole bunch of this. I've, you know, I've had my students do this. And then there'll be one student, it's a little sad, because there'll be like maybe one student in the back who, whose parents have sort of you know, not let her watch television or do these things. <laughs> and there's one girl in the back and she said, looked around and went, how are people getting these? Like, what is this? It's some mystical knowledge that, that everybody, I mean, the point is everybody knows this is Tommy. I mean, you may not know, but trust me, everybody else knows. And then, of course, if I cut this off, this is Ralph Lauren, all right, they're selling, oh, yeah, this is another perfume thing, okay? At first, I thought they were selling boots, but no, it turns out perfume. <laughs> and, um, and uh, okay, oh, and then, see, then you have different, it's, again, it's important that the person be of a certain kind. And that person doesn't have to be a kind that you necessarily would like yourself, right? It has to appeal to a certain particular niche group. So I found this one. I don't, again, I don't really know anything about Kenneth Cole. I'm really, uh, but I found this sort of set of advertisements. And every single one of the advertisements in this catalog was exactly the same. It had this woman, right, totally anemic, looking the same way, like sitting around this sort of house looking off into the distance, extremely depressed, with this child looking at her like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and every, you think, that sells clothes? But I guess it must, right? I mean, it must appeal to a certain sort of New York intellectual sort of thing. And somewhere, I think, maybe it wasn't, it was just a different magazine. There's another one. This is Prada, okay? <laughs> now, I, I gotta tell you, I'm sorry, but when I was in high school, that was like the poster child for geek, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just like, that kid is a model? Jeez, I could, you know, like, anybody could be. But that obviously is something that appeals to, you know, again, a certain sort of New York intellectual. He's in a New York apartment, right? So it's, you have to get something that appeals to that group, OK? Here, of course, everybody has to get in on the, the act. You know, you think, oh, this is just sophisticated marketing. Here we have Target. Shop at Target.com, and of course, people who shop at Target are very easygoing, cool dudes, etc., etc. This, they are nice to uh, tell you, this is Marcus, his major pre med. Actually, I never thought about this. There is no major pre med. <laughs> you major in biology or chemistry, anyway, but his major is pre med. His favorite phrase is, I can do that, right? Supposedly, okay? This guy really isn't, as you'll see as we go on, this guy probably really isn't Marcus, et cetera, et cetera. But here's a good example, actually, after I had showed some of these, you know, different point to a student of mine. This is a number of years back. 
the student said to me, oh, Professor Smith, you've got to see the uh, Abercrombie and Fitch catalog. They used to do these big catalogs. Okay, actually then one after this had student, it was like a spring break catalog. I'm not showing you anything from that. Right, but again, um, and, and the student, and the, and the girl said to me, oh, Professor Smith, have you seen the new Abercrombie Fitch catalog? And I said, well, not really, actually. But, because um, I don't really get it, but okay. Um, and she said, oh, it's like, you know, spring break, and they're wearing no clothes. Right, and, you, and I said, really, no clothes? And she goes, yeah, like nothing, you know? And I was like, you'd think the last people in the world who would want to, you know, sort of inspire nakedness would be a clothing manufacturer, <laughs> right? But, okay, but anyway, this is one called A Very Emerson Christmas, okay? And it was done, um, anyway, yeah, there's, it, now you should close your eyes. I mean, again, there's nothing really bad, but for some people it's, it's bad enough. Okay, the whole thing was done as a Christmas album, right? Here's Charles, Brian, me, it says me, Whitney, Adam, and Michael come home for Christmas, right? And this is their little Christmas, right, catalog. Here are the kids, they're, they're penniless, right? <laughs> Maybe because they spent all their money on Abercrombie and Fitch underwear, but anyway, the point is they, they have no money and, and abs, but all right. This is one of their friends. This is Allie Case, voted most likely to succeed home from her first semester at Wellesley. Sure she is, yeah. <laughs> Wellesley, yeah, she's at Wellesley. Okay, and here's Allie, all right? And it's very nice, see the Abercrombie Fish people were very, very nice because they took the Christmas sort of photo catalog and then on the facing page, they would have the exact same clothing that she's wearing, right, over here so you could buy it, right? So you could have that sweater was over here and then you could just order that sweater because you're like, oh, look, I want Ali Case from Wellesley's sweater. Because, you know, it's true if you're like in New England at Christmas time, you might want a sweater like this, particularly if you're dressed like that. <laughs> okay, so here's his sister Whitney and here's their friends Ophelia Summers and Jed Washburn. Okay, I mean, it goes on. I mean, so they got, here's Jed Washburn in the grass. They go somewhere and Jed is there and and just like you and me, when I have my blue blazer on, I lay in the grass. And um, <laughs> here's their friends, they're like Ophelia and Jed, I think, with their polo ponies, named after classical um, beasts, I mean, after classical characters, I can't remember exactly what they were. Here's um, Shoes in a Nook, over here. Emerson Heirlooms, my grandfather's father's Weegens. Okay, and I, I actually had no idea what that meant until like, just like two years ago, and Weegens are kind of shoe, I guess, okay? Anyway, they're shoes you wear with um, expensive clothing, I guess. Anyway, and here's some more of their friends, Cleo and I, et cetera, et cetera. And then they go, oh, they have a seaside seance, okay? <laughs> they're all around. Here they all are, okay? And then we spent the day at the beach trying to summon winter from its slumber. Most of us stayed the night as well, cooking clams that Tom and Charlie had dug from the tidal flats and watching diamond dust fall from the sky across flickering fireside shadows, right? I think old Eric needs to go back to school, but all right. <laughs> so they do this, and so they go around, and they have, you know, then there's other places. Here's Lakeside Lounging, Northwest Cove, Halibut Point, right? All their friends, on and on. Oh, that's the obelisk, Northwest Cove, Halibut Point. This rock was the unofficial epicenter of our youthful imaginations, the home base for TAG, the bulwark for it to be conquered. Adam by the obelisk, okay, right, so. I don't know, they go, while they're home for Christmas, it's a very busy time, there's a wedding, okay, sorry for the line to the minute, and um, yeah, I, I mean, please don't ask me, I really don't know, students always ask, why do they have ducks? <laughs> I, I really, I just don't know, and, but you will notice that there is at this wedding a Catholic priest and a Jewish rabbi, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? I, I don't exactly know what that's about, okay, but anyway, here they are. All right, and when I went to weddings, if I was younger, my mother would let me dress just like this. <laughs> I have to admit though, when I was in college, this is what I wanted to be like. I desperately wanted to be preppy this way, you know, New England, preppy, rich, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted my home to look like this. <laughs> right? I mean, I wanted my brothers to be quirky and weird and carry ducks and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I wanted my dad to look like this. <laughs> My dad, rest in peace, bless his, you know, he wore white shoes and plaid jackets and listened to Lawrence Welk and, 
He couldn't have been further from, he didn't play golf, he didn't have a putter, you know. I didn't get Jeeps for Christmas, okay? Yay, right? Now, you do know, do you not, right? You have to sort of, I mean, you know this, I'm sorry, but you know, there might still be some students around. You do know, there are no Emersons, right? That isn't their house, you know? That's like Murray Steinbaum's house, okay? These are all just Abercrombie and Fitch models, every one of them, hired for this photo shoot. You can tell particularly, I think we have one of these things, like with this guy, okay? Because you know, people tell you when they're modeling, it's extremely boring, because you gotta take the same movie, same thing, you gotta take the same picture over and over 100 times, you know? Okay, they say, now go like this, now go like this, you know, click, you know? And so these guys have been shouting with joy so many times, yay, okay, try to click, you know? Yay, click. This guy is completely disgusted. Right? This guy's like, yay, would you get done with this, okay? Right? None of them knew each other before like two days ago. Right? There's no Emersons. It's all made up. It's an entire creation of an entire family with friends, friends who have biographies, right? Stories of their lives, etc., etc. None of it's real at all. It's only created to make a persona that, you know, to sell kids clothes on the facing page. Here's Brian Dalton, we call him BD, surprisingly enough, <laughs> performing his patented present de dance delivery, right? And yes, if you're wearing boxer shorts, you need a sweater and a tie. I, I don't, <laughs> here's Adam's Pub, Old Flames, giving it one last go, Clay. I mean, there's, you create just a whole, lives of people, you know, three degrees of separation from the people you're talking from, the Emerson family, all right? But again, I wanted to be like that guy, okay? And of course, since it's a, uh, College thing, you gotta have party, right? Because that's what you do in college. It's interesting because there are people who deal with um, alcohol counseling. And what they will tell you is alcohol behavior is socially constructed, socially conditioned. So that you can go to a party, right? And you can spread a rumor among credible people at the party that the, that the punch has been spiked with Everclear. Everclear is very, very powerful but very hard to detect, I guess, right? And so people, you can say, no, there's ever clear in the punch. Not a drop of alcohol. People will get drunk, dancing on the tables drunk, falling down drunk, throwing up drunk, simply because they think this is the behavior that I'm supposed to have because I'm supposed to be at a party where we're drinking hard liquor, right? All right, now. Sorry, go back, just one. For, for some my students who, re, you know, look at these guys, okay? Look at this whole sort of bunch of Abercrombie and Fitch deals. And I have a lot of students this way who are, th that way here, who don't, not like this, but who look at this. And I remember actually when I was applying for a job here, there was a wonderful student, a guy named Anthony Calio, right? And Anthony has uh, tattoos all up this arm and down this arm, okay? And uh, he actually knew the E.D. Hirsch cultural literary, stu the literary stuff, and he was like, Okay, he came up to me after I'd showed them this stuff and he says to me, you know, I hate those people. <laughs> I hate them, right? And I said, but don't you think that there's, you know, your group has its own sort of things? And he admitted yes. So a lot of the students that I have who hate the whole Abercrombie and Fitch look and thing will go into the mall and go over to this store. It's a store called Hot Topic, okay? And at Hot Topic, you know, you can get your different kinds of jeans and, and you know, hair and uh, metal stuff and studded belts and anyway, stuff that goes along with that, right? There's only one small problem for those students. Hot Topic is owned by Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> the corporate marketers at Abercrombie and Fitch know that among a certain crowd, their a &F persona is held in contempt. So they merely created another persona and another store to lure in those who straggle away from their first store in disgust. But these would-be anti-establishment rebels soon find themselves simply buying into another equally slick, corporately produced model of cool, complete with its own selection of favorite music groups, magazines, and movies. That's what this stuff over here is all about, right? And then you can go through and list what's the latest album you're supposed to be listening to, what's the latest game you're supposed to be playing, et cetera, et cetera, that goes along with that persona. The key in each case is that the advertiser must identify the aspirational model of the particular consumer group 
and then associate their brand with that imitative ideal. Or in the case of a celebrity model, literally with that individual person. The Nike slogan, be like Mike, illustrates the practice nicely, but examples could be multiplied endlessly. All right, failing to find the mean. It is important to note that the members of each mimetic group described above will be convinced that they have found the right sort of balance between too much and too little. They, uniquely, have the right sort of taste in consumer items, live in the right sort of house, wear the right sort of clothes, and listen to the right sort of music. Other groups are either too trendy or too straight-laced. Each group considers its choices temperate when compared with the choices of other groups, neither spending money extravagantly, like those in the upper classes, nor wasting it foolishly, like the lower ones. This system of interrelated, mutually rejecting, and self-justifying desires often goes by the name competitive consumption. But the com competition is not merely to see who can have the biggest, the best, and the most expensive. That sort of disease is easy to uh, diagnose. We see it parody in parried in parodied in movies and TV shows all the time. But then again, such parodies are all part of the game, making those who have made different consumer choices from our own look ridiculous while legitimating our own. What is more difficult for us to become mindful of is the way in which our own group's mimetic model of the right sort of person is causing us to waste money on consumer items we do not need and to justify those choices by comparing them with the consumer choices of other groups. On one side of town, spending $50,000 on a BMW, sorry I wrote this a few years ago, I know, you can't really get a car, for, a BMW for $50,000. <clears> I don't know, I don't have a BMW, all right. Just spending $50,000 on a BMW, quote, just made sense. It is a reliable car, a good investment. After all, they hadn't bought the $70,000 Mercedes-Benz after all, and $10,000 in tuition for private school. That's the kind of sacrifice a good parent is willing to make. On the other side of town, the BMW and the expensive tuition are both likely to be considered uppity, the trappings of someone putting on airs, trying to look better than everyone else. A parent with $3,000 in disposable income would be more likely to spend it on a large screen TV or an above ground pool. Purchase that would, purchases that would probably be considered irresponsible by families on that first side of town. What about the children's education, their wealthier counterparts will undoubtedly ask. Isn't that more important than a TV set or an above ground pool? In their neighborhood, among their aspirational group, yes. On the other side of town though, a parent who can supply an above ground pool to his children and their friends would be a great provider, one who might well look upon a parent who spends $50,000 on a BMW as spoiled and self-indulgent. As Harvard professor Juliet Shore has written, quote, American consumers are often not conscious of being motivated by social status and are far more likely to attribute such motives to others than to themselves. We live with high levels of psychological denial about the connection between our buying habits and the social statements they make. The truth is when many of us buy a certain item, we identify ourselves as a certain kind of person, belonging to or wishing to belong to a certain group. Among teenagers, it might be punk, goth, prep, or Rastafarian. While among adults, the groups may not have the same kind of recognizable names, except among advertisers, but they exist nonetheless. Go to the web, to the PRISM, P-R-I-Z-M, marketing site and punch in your zip code. There you'll find out whether you are a member of one of 23 different consumer groups into which advertisers divide the country. You'll find out, for example, whether you are a member of, quote, upward bound, that's one group, elite suburbs, pools and patios, or aging boomers. <laughs> a good marketing executive will be able to tell from your zip code alone where you shop and what kinds of things you are likely to buy. Adults may not recognize their consumer choices and tastes as being manifestations of the desires to be a member of upward bound or elite suburbs rather than pools and patios or God help us aging boomers, but advertisers know the truth of it. People in River Oaks don't get ads for Low Rider magazine and people who live around Hobby Airport don't get free copies of the J. Crew catalog in the mail. Thus, contrary to what many Americans would like to believe, we do continue to have dif distinct class differences in America. It's simply that no one likes to talk about them, and they don't operate the way they used to in the past. They ceased to operate as moral regulators within the culture a generation or so ago. Class in America is now no longer based on a recognized set of societal obligations and responsibilities, but rather on the kind of consumer items one tends to buy. Thus, modern class membership in America rarely offers anything like moral guidance. 
At most, it serves as a kind of aesthetic police force regulating consumer purchases. It doesn't tell you how much is too much or too little. Rather, it tells you whether, as a tax attorney, you should drive a Mazda Miata or a BMW S-Class sedan, choose the BMW, or so I am told by my former college roommate, now a tax attorney, former Mazda Miata owner, or whether, as a college student, you should buy CDs by Britney Spears or Bruce Springsteen, Bruce, and whether, if you go to a blue-collar bar, you should order a Bud Light or a Sam Adams Honey Porter Ale. Grit your teeth and buy the Bud Light. Note that the relative cost of these items is largely unimportant, but the class implications of buying one over the other are. These modern class distinctions do what class distinctions have always done, namely provide a certain sense of belonging. What they do not do, however, is give us a meaningful framework for thinking about the kinds of activities that are necessary to preserve our common life together. The result is that we have a wholesale loss of the sense of balance achieved in earlier societies by a more civic and communal understanding of the virtues. Rather than developing communities of virtue, we have segregated ourselves into what might best be called lifestyle enclaves, places where we're comfortable with each other's choices in cars, clothes, and coffee makers, but don't necessarily want to talk to one another. The bottom line is this. If we don't pay closer attention to the ways in which our mimetic desires are being systematically skewed by advertising, branding, and fashion, we will largely fail to recognize whether we are truly acting temperately or not. Our tendency toward temperance will either be overwhelmed by the organized creation of dissatisfaction at being merely middle class, or dissipated by resentful egalitarian impulses against those who have more than we do, or perhaps merely have something different. These impulses will cause us to compare ourselves and those in our aspirational group favorably with all those whose incomes are higher or whose spending patterns are different, resulting in the perception among many, among us, that we are just barely making it or barely keeping up with our select comparison group and not living extravagantly at all. Thus, when we look for, our, for clues to our failure, in the area of temperance, we need to examine not only the lusts and appetites that are so obviously at work, but also the mimetic ideals that may have subtly corrupted our common moral, our moral common sense. We need to discipline our appetites, to be sure, but we also need to examine our desire for recognition by the right sort of people, because we are being defeated not merely by our lusts, but by our pride. Finally, Christ, the more meaningful mimetic model. Pope John Paul II suggests in his great encyclical on Catholic social doctrine, Chantissimus Honest, that the manner in which new needs arise and are defined is always marked by a more or less appropriate concept of man and of his true good. A given culture reveals its overall understanding of life through the choices it makes in production and consumption. It is here that the phenomenon of consumerism arises in singling out new needs and new means to meet them. One must be guided by a comprehensive picture of man which respects all the dimensions of his being and which subordinates his material and instinctive dimensions to his interior and spiritual ones. If, on the contrary, a direct appeal is made to his instincts while ignoring in various ways the reality of the person as intelligent and free, then consumer attitudes and lifestyles can be created which are objectively improper and often damaging to his physical and spiritual health. The Pope is right. We must take seriously the notion of the human person that is revealed by our consumerism. For we do damage to our children and to our fellow citizens when we allow advertisers to define what it is to be a somebody in terms of different consumer items. And we must not continue to allow marketers and advertisers to manipulate our search for individual identity and our desire for recognition in such a way that it obscures the true nature of the human person. Our situation might be very different, for example, if we thought of our self-identity uh, self in terms of service to others rather than in terms of owning certain kinds of stuff. As Pope John Paul affirms, quote, it is not wrong to want to live better. What is wrong is a style of life which is presumed to be better when it is directed towards having rather than being and wants to have more, not in order to be more, but in order to spend life in enjoyment as an end in itself. Thus our notion of temperance must be based on a profound spiritual humility that says neither my worth, my value, nor my identity is determined by what I own. Rather, my worth, my value, and my identity are determined by who I am. 
and who I am as a Christian has everything to do with the person in whose image I am meant to be. Thus, if temperance is really to take root in our society, we will need a powerful mimetic model that can take the place of all the false mimetic ideals being sold to us day in and day out by the culture of consumerism. Since the problem is one that involves the perversion of our mimetic desires, the solution must be accomplished by replacing our present models with one that is more in accord with the dignity of the human person and with the truth of human flourishing. For Christians, this model has always been found in the person of Jesus Christ, who, as the incarnation of the God in whose image we have been made, reveals to us the deepest truth about our humanity. It was Pope John Paul II, once again, who reminded us, quote, people today need to turn to Christ once again in order to receive from him the answer to their questions about what is good and what is evil. At the source and summit of the economy of salvation, as the alpha and the omega of human history, Christ sheds light on man's condition and his integral vocation. Consequently, the man who wishes to understand himself thoroughly and not just in his being must, with his unrest, uncertainty, and even his weakness and sinfulness, with his life and death, draw near to Christ. He must, so to speak, enter him with all his own self. He must appropriate and assimilate the whole of the reality of the incarnation and redemption in order to find himself. What we see in the mimetic model of Jesus Christ, then, is precisely the image of a true and authentic person. That is why other mimetic models, no matter how valuable, will, in the end, end up with, at best, ambiguous results, as Cervantes brilliantly illustrated with the example of Don Quixote and the chivalric ideal. In the end, all our mimetic ideals must be grounded in this most fundamental image, to be like Christ. To take other models as defining our identity must, in the end, leave us something less than fully human and will fail to satisfy the deepest longings of the human heart. What sort of things does Christ reveal to us about our humanity, and how can it guide and inform our understanding of temperance? A few things. First, taking Christ as our mimetic model would validate and reinforce the social conception of the human person. According to Christian faith, we are made in the image of the triune God, he who is three persons in one being, a perfect unity in diversity and diversity in unity. The unity of their being does not obliterate the differences between the persons, while the differences between the persons does not destroy the unity of their being. God is thus essentially relational. And if we are to be in his image, we must understand ourselves as fundamentally relational as well. We are, as the Greek philosopher Aristotle understood, essentially social beings. And yet, by the same token, that social character is not fully realized in a merely contractual set of relationships as the philosopher Thomas Hobbes thought. Our social nature is not fulfilled by binding ourselves to others merely for the purposes of securing our own economic self-interest. Our flourishing as full and complete human persons demands fellowship and communion with others, a communion based on shared love and self-giving, just as the three persons in the Godhead share themselves completely with one another, giving themselves and receiving themselves back totally from the other in a bond of selfless love. As the Second Vatican Council's pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world says, quote, indeed the Lord Jesus, when he prayed to the Father that all may be one as we are one, opened up vistas closed to human reason, for he implied a certain likeness between the union of the divine persons and the unity of God's sons in truth and charity. This likeness reveals that man, who is the only creature on earth which God willed for itself, cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. Taking Christ as our mimetic model, in other words, reveals one of the great paradoxes of our humanity, that unlike material things which decrease when we give them away, the more human persons give of themselves, the more they become. Secondly, a specifically Christian notion of temperance would have nothing whatsoever to do with the hatred of material things. In Genesis 1, God declares that all of his creation is good, very good. And St. John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And through him all things were made. And the Word, without whom nothing was made, became flesh and dwelled among us, giving his own body up for us on the cross, and died and rose again on the third day, and ascended body and soul into heaven, where he has prepared a place for us 
so that we too may enjoy the resurrection of the body. Christianity, as I always tell my students, is a very fleshy religion. We might call it incarnational. <laughs> On this view, it is not matter or flesh or even contemporary consumer items that are evil. It is rather the will to use God's gifts for our own selfish ends rather than for the love of God and neighbor. Christian temperance bids us not to tie our identity to created things, not because they are intrinsically evil, but because they are necessarily limited. The problem for contemporary men and women is not that they want too much, it is that they settle on too little. No created thing can be our ultimate end because no created thing can fulfill our deepest longings and desires. God has put into us an infinite desire for an infinite and eternal good. The tragedy of created things is that they promise a fulfillment that they can't possibly deliver. British author Margaret Atkins once again has described the problem with clarity and precision. Why have we ceased to value the virtues of limit? Why do we no longer believe that there is an appropriate measure of the use of material goods? The answer is that we have abandoned an older understanding of happiness. For Aristotle, happiness was an activity, that is the activity of living well, living virtuously. Christianity infused his account with grace, but the essential point remained. We were happy when we were living well, living responsively to God. Happiness depended on who you were, or more, precis pre more precisely, how you were. It, not, it did not depend on what you had. Your possessions could contribute to your happiness, but only if they were enabling you to live well. The purpose of using goods was the Christian life. A specifically Christian view of temperance would view created realities as signs or symbols of God's love. They are meant to point beyond themselves to the one who freely bestowed the gift. We might describe this as a sacramental view of creation. Created, created realities are meant to point us toward an ultimate end that lies beyond themselves, just as the ink and paper of a book are meant not merely to point to what they themselves are, ink and paper, but to signify something beyond themselves a poem by Robert Frost, a play by William Shakespeare, a love letter to one's wife. The problem is that we look upon material stuff as though it could give us meaning and value, when in fact meaning and value are things that need to be bestowed upon them. A study at the University of Chicago, for example, asked families what objects in the home they cherished most. The adult members of the families that described themselves as happy picked things that reminded them of other people and good times they'd had together. The members of families who said they were dissatisfied with their lives tended to focus merely on the physical qualities of things. We can come to believe that things can fill our deepest longings and our need for a lasting, indeed infinite good, and yet they cannot. And when they fail us, as they are fated to do, then sadly some will start to associate the evil with the material thing instead of locating the problem where it really arises in our own hearts and in, in the unwise use we are making of things. University of Florida sociologist James Twitchell compares, uh, captures the paradox nicely when he declares that we in American society, quote, are not too materialistic. Rather, if anything, we are not materialistic enough. But note that Twitchell didn't say we aren't too avaricious. His point Rather, is that, quote, if we craved objects and knew what they meant, there would be no signifying systems like advertising, packaging, fashion, and branding to get in the way. We would gather, use, toss out, or hoard based on some inner sense of value. It is that inner sense of value that we don't have. Strange, is it not, that whereas it is supposed to be Christianity that generates dissatisfaction with life and contempt for material things, we find upon examination that it is our current consumer culture that is more likely to generate dissatisfaction with ourselves and with the things we own. We are much more likely to despise things not in accord with our own cultural subgroup than our people who rejoice in all of God's creation precisely because it is God's. A rigidly austere monk would never be able to view an expensive pair of blue jeans with as much contempt as a teenager who finds them hopelessly out of style. Material things are gifts from the one who loves us more than we love ourselves. Valuing them for themselves alone would be like enjoying a diamond engagement ring, not as a symbol of the love of one's betrothed, but merely as an expensive item of jewelry. As though one could say, I have the ring now, why do I need the man? 
when this happens, what had been something meaningful. Meaningful meaning being something which must be given by a person. What had been something meaningful becomes a meaningless dead piece of matter. And quite frankly, when this happens, you stop owning the ring and the ring starts owning you. We are being challenged, therefore, by our contemporary consumer culture to re-envision our patterns of consumption in terms of a true humanism, one grounded in the image of Christ. Why this particular mimetic model rather than others? Because Christ reveals to us the truth about the human person. Because in becoming like Christ, we become not less human, not less like ourselves, but more human, and finally, truly ourselves. Because looking at Christ, we see not only a worthy moral exemplar exhibiting a set of external rules and regulations from above, rather we see ourselves, that is, our true and authentic selves, cut free from all mimetic images and illusions. If we are to once again rediscover the goal and purpose of temperance, we must look to the incarnate Son, who is God's free gift of himself poured out for us. If, on the other hand, the virtue of temperance is not grounded in a true Christian humanism, then I believe temperance will continue to remain in our present culture an unattainable and indeed a largely unimaginable goal. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Smith will be happy to take some questions. I have a microphone here, which they'll need to pick up your, your questions. So um, if you'll raise your hand, I'll be glad to uh, bring it to you. So we'll take maybe about 10 minutes worth of questions, if there are any. Would anyone have a question? OK, so no questions. <laughs> no. Sorry, turn on. Father. It helps if you go like this, bang, bang, bang on the chair. Okay. First, congratulations. Okay, I think this is a very challenging topic because you're trying to find a way of how to market or advertise God's kingdom on earth. Okay. Um, I would just like to add something that I consider vital. Mm -hmm. No, that is the Eucharist, because through the Eucharist, God transfers virtues or gives graces. I think virtues are built through trials in life. No, and it's very difficult to teach a virtue in a TV show. No. But we try our best through advertising, and God does the rest through the Eucharist. No, I mean, so does everyone understand that? I mean, the point is, I think, of one really well taken about the importance of the Eucharist. And um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it seems to me that uh, if I can just like develop that thought for a second in, in terms of my talk, and I'll try not to be uh, too long, which is to say, I try to suggest um, three things, right, uh, particularly at the end about a mimetic model that might come, or using Christ as a mimetic model, and how that might help animate our notion of temperance. One had to do with relational aspect of the human person. One had to do with a sort of incarnational view of the human person. Another one had to do with uh, a sacramental view of creation. All those things are contained, it seems to me, and communicated in and through the Eucharist. Right? A God who is fundamentally relational, and we in relation with him. Right? A God who communicates himself to us in an incarnate form. Right? I mean, for those who take the Eucharist and think of it in that way, they are faced with the incarnation. And they are faced with the fact right in front of them that they cannot hate or despise created reality. Right? God becomes a human person. God becomes right, flesh in and through the bread of the Eucharist. Right? So all those things, it seems to me, are communicated in the act of taking the Eucharist. And we should see that. Right? And, I mean, and the point is, you're quite right. Ultimately, let me make no mistake about this, right? it isn't just a visual thing. It isn't just actually, this is where the idea of the mimetic model sort of doesn't, isn't sufficient. When we take the Eucharist, of course, the beauty of that act 
is that right, when you usually eat bread and drink wine, it becomes your body and your blood. Right? I mean, it's transformed through this miraculous thing into you. The miracle of taking the Eucharist is that we are transformed into his body and his blood, right? And we have access to graces and to virtues which wouldn't necessarily be our own, right? So there is undoubtedly nothing better, it seems to me, right? I say as a Catholic, as a Catholic convert, than taking the Eucharist, right? If you say, I want to develop the virtues, at the heart of the human virtues is love, as Thomas Aquinas says, right? They're all animated by charity. And if you say to yourself, okay, how do I want, you know, if I want to develop the virtues, how do I do that? The answer is, well, love people, right? Uh, can you order love? No, your first step is to open yourself up to receive love, right? So you receive God's love in the Eucharist, and then we believe, yeah, right? God can do things in us that we couldn't do for ourselves, right? Just as you know very well that you're capable of doing things when you love, that otherwise you simply wouldn't be able to do, right? People who are parents know this better than anyone else, right? That's why for teenagers, looking at people who have children is always like, how could anybody do that? Were they crazy? What, you know. From the outside, it seems impossible. From the inside, right? When you love, it seems possible, right? Everything becomes possible. But anyway, but no, thank you, right? I don't know whether that... No other questions. Uh, I didn't speak loudly. Me too. Right. <laughs> I just wonder if you'd like to comment. You've been talking about material things, clothing, cars, and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, there are a bunch of other ideas that are being uh, promulgated today that somebody can offer to us, like hope and change. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this could <laughs> 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 Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think actually Robin made this a very interesting point, right? Which is to say, um, advertisements, okay, come in a number of different uh, ways, right? And 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 uh, modern day politics of whatever party or ever side, right, makes use of advertising slogans, which in and of its, itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? But one has to sort of say to oneself, you know, what what is this? You know, what are the passions and impulses this is really trying to appeal to in me, right? And uh, anyway, I mean, I, it seems to me that actually uh, I'm, I'm a, in some ways less concerned about that, uh, the direct sort of thing, right? Because I think people, particularly youth, because I teach college students, tend to be more cynical about direct appeals. Right, any kind of patriotic fervor, whether of one side, you know, whether of the left or the right. Like, so people say, rah, rah, America, they tend to be like, yeah, whatever, okay? If they go, you know, we can change the world, end all poverty, they go, yeah, right, okay, okay. So they tend not to be so, not everyone, but they tend not to be so, you know, affected by that. I'm more concerned um, when a candidate or, you know, a product or a TV show or I just anything becomes like cool. That's what you have to look for, right? You have to look for who's selling themselves because they're cool, right? All the cool people like them, all the cool people are hanging out with them, et cetera, et cetera. That, it seems to me, is more uh, problematic. Or, you know, again, on both sides. Oh, look, he, you know, my favorite person is hanging out with. This is what Hollywood celebrities hanging out with one candidate or the other has to do with, right? Like, why would any serious candidate hang out with, you know, either Arnold Schwarzenegger or Oprah? Right? I mean, like, what would that do? I mean, like, how, what would that mean? And the answer is, or Bruce Willis, or whoever it would be. Right? And the answer is, it's got everything to do just with cool. Who shows up on Letterman, right? Or on Jon Stewart's show? Like, why would anybody do that? Like, a serious candidate. This is a serious country, right? We have serious problems. And people don't, you know, actually talk seriously. They show up on Letterman, or they show up on Jon Stewart's show. The point is, what's that about? And the answer is, it's all about cool. And I resent that, right? I think if they were serious, none of them would go on there, right? You would talk seriously to people and you wouldn't, you know, sort of say, oh, I gotta, you know, I gotta appeal to teenagers by going on and looking cool. But anyway. I wonder if this doesn't have something to do with the fact that we somehow in other words were not able to teach critical thinking. Um, I mean, we, we well, I mean, there's, that's, a, that's a sort of loaded question. 
Uh, it's, it's because I actually have a proposal before the um, a core reform committee, which has a whole thing about teaching critical thinking. So that's um, so I couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, I'm supposed to say, uh, well, yeah, but here at the University of St. Thomas, we teach critical thinking, right? So the point is, okay. Like, if you believe that, if you think, you know, the problem in society is that we just don't teach critical thinking. That's the problem. Well, then I would say you should support the University of St. Thomas, <laughs> right? Because that's what we do, right? Where's the president? Oh, dang it, OK? <laughs> he's never here when you need him, right? Well, actually, he is. It's not true he's never here, but you know, like, somebody got to tell him. OK, no, but it's true. I mean, I think there's something true about that, right? I mean, you've got to support that kind of education. Because, I mean, and you, you have to watch your kids. I mean, like, why are they going to, I mean, <laughs> having been a graduate student at Notre Dame, I know very well, I'm sure it's true of A&M and all these other places. It's like, um, how do, you know, how do, not only uh, um, admissions figures, right, students applying go up, but also giving to the university goes up when the football team starts to win, right? And you say, what the heck is that? Right? What does that mean? The football team is you know, like in the top 10 or something like that, and everybody believes in Charlie Weiss. And so it means, not just in terms of going to a bowl, but in terms of giving to the university an extra 15 or 20 or 30 million or 50 million dollars. Right? So you, know, you could start playing that game, I guess. And you could start saying, you know, we got a winning basketball team. You know, come to the University of St. Thomas. Or you could say, we're a serious business, and we teach kids how to think critically, right? But of course, you say to teenagers, we teach you how to think critically. And they go, yeah, who's got a good football team? Anyway, <laughs> right? Where are the cool kids going? I don't know, I don't know, right? Um, doctor, um, it seems that um, this entire kind of matrix of advertising and so forth can only thrive on a society that doesn't obviously have much self-reflect, you know, reflect very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think recently the Pope, in his, criti in his um, criticism of the media, says that we need to take um, a sabbatical, so to speak, from the images and so forth that they constantly berate us with so we can fill ourselves with the images of, of our faith. But Yeah, a very long sabbatical. Yeah. Yeah. What I what I'm asking is is should the church I mean it seems like um we want to make sure that we always emphasize that matter is good. We don't want to ever say that you know for example television in and of itself can be used for many good things, but might it be more helpful if we were to encourage uh more aggressively a um a uh, absence of television or other things from our lives? just in order to have the space to be able to reflect and even think about the way we have these mimetic models and going on? Yeah, this is actually a good, a good question. Um, although it's sort of problematic because the whole lecture series is sort of about you know, using the media, right? <laughs> and uh, and um, so you know, it's sort of like, oh. And, and, I, and I, always, I always hear this, you know, that um, I mean, I've heard it ever since I was a kid. That television can be used for good educational purposes, and I, you know, we we had television in my classroom when I was a kid. You know, it was like, oh, because we're going to use this for good educational purposes, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, you know, I went through all this years and years and years of education. I've never actually seen it. It never actually realized if it ever had that potential. I've never ever seen it realize that potential, right? I mean, I think it could do certain things well. Okay, in terms of theater, we don't tend to do it in the United States. They tend to do it in England, right? BBC productions, you can actually get a whole Shakespeare play or you know, all of Jane Austen, you know, because you can do it over a period of time. But um, in terms of, you know, so that, yes, but in terms of a real educational thing, uh, you know, it, the, the medium is the message in a way, and television tends to be way too passive, I think, for uh, the good of education. You have to pay a lot of attention to that. In other words, it seems to me there's nothing better, nothing that can replace. Uh, this is going to seem very self-serving. There's nothing that can replace an actual human person, right? Who's there, who talks to you, who listens to you, who looks you in the eye, right? There's simply nothing better 
than what Socrates did with his students in Athens, you know, 400 years BC, which is to say you talk, you listen, you ask questions, you think back and forth, and no technology ever devised ever since then has done much better, right? Usually it ends up getting in the way, but you know, sometimes it can be used, but basically, basic, I mean, as a teacher, it's true. You gotta say, if the whole thing got blown up, right? I mean, you know, all the technology and all the, all the computers we had in every classroom, et cetera, et cetera, we'd just go out into the, you know, onto the grass in the middle and we'd sit down with our students and we'd read books and we'd talk to them and we'd teach them and that would be fine, right? We'd be okay. But yeah, TV, one of these days. <laughs> I know, right? It's gonna, right? It's gonna realize its potential, right? I, I can't help but think, right? How about another round of applause for Dr. Scott? Oh, yeah.